Thank you, Dr. Herschel, and uh, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Herschel for inviting me in this instruction course. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, the question is that uh, we have this uh, this stuff, this IOL, toric intraoperal lens, available in our kitty. Now, whether we need this new this premium IOL or not, or whether the outcome is good, whether it, it, it should be promoted or not. So the question is, uh, before I go, uh, I would like to declare that I have no financial interest in the subject matter of this presentation. Now, the question is, why do we need, what's the need of a toric IOL? We have been implanting spherical IOLs and we are getting reasonably good results. Uh, why to move to a premium IOL which is new and I mean, there's always that question mark on the outcome of a new thing, although it's no more new, but, but the results and outcomes have been found to be quite good. But the question is, why do we need it? The reason why we need it is that we have a fair amount of patients who have astigmatism who undergo cataract surgery, and that is nearly 10% of patients have two diopter or higher astigmatism who undergo cataract surgery. And it's a known fact that if we have an uncorrected astigmatism, then the image form will not be clear. It will not be as crisp as we have when the visual, uh, the vision without astigmatism. So it's a known fact to all of us, and that's why the idea is to correct the astigmatism. So let's go to select the patients. Who are the patients who are fit for it? Who are the patients who require it? Well, those who have astigmatism, that is the issue. But it's not that all the patients who have astigmatism can undergo this uh, lens implantation. So who are the ideal candidates for the, the historic IO implantation? Those who have primary astigmatism and those who have regular astigmatism. There's no doubt the outcomes have shown that the primary regular astigmatism, <coughs> regular astigmatism has uh, shown good results with toric IOLs. As to any astigmatism which is beyond 1.25, I would say, may be you know may require toric IOL for good outcome. Now, with time, the indications have increased, and it has gone beyond primary astigmatism. And cases of keratoconus, who have got, uh, who have uh, achieved stability. They also can be, you know, uh, they also can get benefit out of this uh, premium IOL by, you know, correcting, if not complete, part of the astigmatism that is there because of it. Then, of course, post keratoplasty eyes. <coughs> now, in, in post keratoplasty eyes, again, if you have mild to moderate amount of astigmatism, that can be corrected by uh, uh, toric IOL. However, an essential prerequisite is that if it's a suture keratoplasty, full thickness keratoplasty, any suture, if it's there, it has to be removed and the patient should be evaluated at least after four to six weeks so that the surface stabilizes and then only we decide about the, about the uh, toric IOL, its power and all other factors. Then there are certain situations wherein we should avoid using toric IOLs, like somebody who has to undergo a keratoplasty. Like somebody having, say, fuchs endothelial dystrophy with a reasonable amount of scar, wherein we may not think of doing a desec, maybe, uh, or some other conditions wherein we have to do a full thickness keratoplasty or maybe anterior laminar keratoplasty. In all these conditions where we are not sure about the astigmatism following surgery, we should not do it. And keratoplasty is definitely one condition wherein you know we put so many sutures that the astigmatism can be bizarre. The patients who have capsular bag instability, again, are not a very good candidate. People may have, you know, isolated good results with, you know, with the, the, the subluxated cataracts as well. However, it's advisable not to use toric IOLs in the subluxated cataracts because of the risk of unpredictability of the position of the IOL. So once we see that a patient has a significant astigmatism, then we counsel a per person that if he is given toric IOL, he may have crisp vision without spectacles also. I mean, if he cannot afford that, then maybe he can be given spectacles. But a good counseling of the patient is required. And once the patient is convinced for toric IOL, then the patient has to be thoroughly evaluated. And the evaluation 
includes the biometry, a good evaluation of the corneal curvature, and that can be done by manual keratometry, by you know, all these newer techniques, the automated keratometry, the shim fluke devices, and all these devices. Now, most of the devices have been found to be compatible. However, the gold standard has still been the manual keratometry, and that is being used by uh, most. There's a study done by Koch, and they have, sh they have shown that the posterior curvature does play a role in you know, final astigmatism, and that's why they have given a recommendation that one should decrease the corneal astigmatism by 0.5 diopter with the rule astigmatism, and increase the astigmatism by 0.3 diopter in patients with against the rule astigmatism. However, some of the calculators have not incorporated that, and there can be different opinions on it. So, once the patient has been, uh, the biometry has been done, and the patient has been thoroughly counseled, a thorough evaluation of corneal curvature has been done, then of course we calculate the IL power. Now, since we have the biometry, we can calculate the IL power depending upon the axial length and whatever IL formula that, that suits the person, uh, and that has to be calculated. So spherical power can, can be calculated by that. Then we are left with the toric power, and toric power is calculated by toric calculators. Now, there are various story calculators available, various companies have different calculators. The Alcon have their uh, Alcon Microsoft story calculator. The AMO has its own calculator. Then uh, there are various other, other calculators like Care Group, etc. So, uh, I have most experience, or I would say rather total experience with Microsoft Alcon story calculator only, and this is the calculator which has been used worldwide most often. So, we stick to that. And apart from this calculator, there are other calculators which incorporate just a few other parameters, like the AMO uh, calculator also takes into account the anterior chamber depth. The rest of the things are almost the same. So, let's stick to this. Now, this is the page of the toric calculator, right? So, what does it do? The toric calculator gives you the power of the uh, cylinder in the IOL and also the axis over which the IOL has to be placed. Now, what are you supposed to do? Well, this is what you are supposed to do. So, the first is, of course, you will like the doctor's name, the patient information, the eye selection. Now comes the keratometry. So, the flat K value has to be written and the meridian, the axis also has to be written. Then the next thing you have to uh, enter is steep K and the meridian. Then the spherical power that you have calculated with whatever our idle form formula you have uh, used. Then your own surgically induced astigmatism. Now, say for example, if you have, if you are using 2.2 uh, millimeter incision, then it has been seen that the range of SIA is between 0 0.15 to 0 0.4. But in the, there are individual variations, and you should calculate your own SIA. And there are ways I'll come to that. Then of course the incision location. Now, incision location is given by this, is shown by this. Now, if you are doing a temporal phaco emulsification, then right eye, the inc incision location will be 180 degrees. And left eye, the incision location will be 0 degrees. Next is surgically induced astigmatism. This is basically astigmatism induced during surgery by incision, etc. And manipulation of the wound. Now, since the astigmatic values are composite in nature, they have magnitude, they have directions, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, both the things are there. So they can't just be added or subtracted like that. So there's a, this is the site www.drhill.com in which you can, you have the whole chart wherein you enter certain parameters and you can get your own surgically induced astigmatism. Now, this is the patient chart. Well, apart from the date of surgery in patient A and I, you have to write whether the patient has undergone any prior corneal surgery. <coughs> now, incision location, then incision type, whether it's a clear corneal incision or near clear corneal or clear incision. Then the size of incision, it can range from 0.01 to 9.9. Of course, we don't go to that much. Most of the time, we use either 2.2 or 1.8 or 2.75. The pre-op keratometric value, of the patient, the uh, uh, both the values K1 and K2, then the axis pre-op, both the axis, 
and then the post of values k1 k2 will be accessed now once you have entered then you create and then that is the surgically induced astigmatism for that patient now you do it do like that for say 50 to 100 patients and then you have a good database and of course the incision location has to be the same if you are calculating for that location and that size so for each location or each size if it is different but most of the time it is not so you calculate for 50 to 100 patients and that is your own surgically induced astigmatism and that can be entered into the uh, TORIC calculator. The important thing in calculating uh, surgically induced astigmatism is that you should use the same instrument for pre and post of keratometric measurements. You can do keratometric uh, measurement by various methods but manual keratometry is the gold standard and that is being used. And these are the values actually, the range, uh, 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 it ranges from 35 to 50, anything beyond this requires re-verification. So you have to be careful in that. And again, the, for access also, any, anything beyond this, uh, you know, beyond this certain range, you have to re-verify. So the idea is that you can get, you know, sometimes you can get a bizarre value. But if you recheck it, you can get a proper value. So that, that's the reason why it has to be emphasized because uh, this is important for calculation. Now, this was the part which we enter, right? And then we get it here. We get the values of uh, toricity of the IOL, the cylindrical power and the axis location. So this sheet gives you the value of cylinder as well as the axis over which the IOL has to be placed. You take a printout of this page Paste it in front of your uh, microscope and uh, from where you can see clearly and then you go ahead. So the IO can be placed uh, as per the position described in this. Now apart from these calculators we have one uh, Hoya eye trace uh, calculator. Now this utilizes wavefront also. This is the advantage. Now, this eye trace has the advantage that it gives you the idea of the uh, keratometric astigmatism as well as the internal optics astigmatism. Apart from the other uh, disadvantage, it also gives the advantage that the, you know, it can tell you that this is the model that you need to use. However, if you want to have, you know, variable astigmatism in the post-op period, because it gives you the post-op astigmatism with that particular model as well. So if you want to have any change, any variation, you can opt that model. So this is the flexibility with uh, this toric calculator. There are many, uh, I think 10 monofocal toric and 4 multifocal toric IL models currently available. Now the Acrosoft toric IOLs have, uh, uh, this is uh, what I have used. It starts from uh, uh, one point, corrects at the corneal level from 1.03 to 4.11 diopters. Now, the idea is that you can use any uh, toric uh, uh, IOL, but the results with, in terms of stability of IOL, in terms of non-rotation of IOL in the post-op period has been found to be best with the hydrophobic IOLs. Because these hydrophobic IOLs have the best adhes adhesiveness with the capsule, so there is a shrink wrap effect of the capsule and it adheres, once it is placed in its position, it stays there. So once you have uh, found out that which IO to be used, which power is to be used, what is the axis of location, then the next step is to mark the axis on the cornea of the patient. And uh, from here, I think Dr. Harshal will take over. Thank you. Thank you very much.